Okay, I think that's it. We'll get started. Gmanidi of the Lair of Korja is Michelle Clorney Korig, Art Consul the Heron on Shot in Austin. Augusta on Ahusarum Falchamura Koroi of the Lair, Gudi on Seminar Grace on Shot, a further shore. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Claire McCarthy, and I'm the Consul General of Ireland here in the southern central United States. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to today's webinar, the latest in the Farther Shore series that will focus today on the Irish Civil War. In recent months, as I'm sure some of you already know, the Embassy of Ireland, together with Irish consulates across the United States, have joined with the American Conference for Irish, uh, Irish Studies and Irish Studies programs from leading universities to host this series of lectures and panels, reflecting on, I suppose, what are the final and perhaps the most contested years uh, of the seminal events that shaped our island a century ago. And in today's episode, we are indeed going to focus on the Irish Civil War. Now, I know everybody on this call is already extremely familiar with the technology, but just a gentle reminder that you are warmly welcome and invited to use the Q&A feature for any questions that you have for our panelists. And there is also a chat function which you can use for um, uh, just any information that you want to share with everyone on the call. But please do use the Q&A feature for any questions you have for the panelists so that they can uh, see them and respond to them in due course. Before we uh, kick off the main event, the consulate here in Austin, we are so fortunate to have a partner here in Texas um, of the caliber of the William J. Flynn Center for Irish Studies. The Flynn Center are the real hosts today, and we thought you would enjoy hearing from their wonderful director, Laurie Gallagher, to hear a little bit more about their center, about the center and their work. So Laurie, if you want to turn on your camera and microphone, um, oh, there you are. Great to see you uh, in, in Houston this morning, uh, Laurie. Thank you so much for arranging today's webinar and over to you. Thank you, Claire. Welcome to our gathering today, everyone. We're delighted to be a part of Ambassador Dan Mulhall's A Farther Shore series, along with our good friend, Claire McCarthy. We are proud members of the American Conference for Irish Studies Southern Region and acknowledge ACIS's participation in this wonderful series. In 2003, the University of St. Thomas founded our Center for Irish Studies, and it was created through the collaboration of Honorary Consul General John B. Kane, as well as the university's president emeritus, Dr. Joseph McFadden. For 18 years, it's hard to believe, but we've been offering a broad array of, Amer of academic and cultural programs that have focused on preserving Irish heritage and culture. We teach a full range of Irish studies courses for credit, including Irish language, literature and culture, history and politics, and the Irish American experience. In 2010, we named our center after William J. Flynn of New York for his contributions to the peace process in Ireland beginning in the 1990s. And we've broadened our mission since then to promote peace and reconciliation. Bill Flynn joined us many times in Houston and opened doors for us to take our students to Ireland to study the peace process and to help them meet government officials and religious leaders and cross community leaders involved in the peace process. We offer students scholarships to study in Ireland, as well as to enroll in our Irish studies courses on campus. With History of Ireland since 1600 being one of the courses I teach, I am particularly looking forward to hearing our panelists today on their studies of Irish history and particularly their focus on the Irish Civil War. I'm also by our Irish born professor of Irish language and literature, Professor Jonathan O'Neill. But first, back to you, Claire. Enjoy this day. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, Laurie. Not just for today's um, webinar, but for everything that you do. Um, uh, you are absolutely the driving force behind the Flint Centre for Irish Studies, and we're very grateful to have you as, as a dear friend of the consulate. So um, we're going to be handing over now to um, on Tullov, uh, Professor Jonathan O'Neill. Jonathan, do you want to put on your camera and microphone so people can get a look at you? There you are. <laughs> um, Jonathan, uh, great to see you in, in Houston today. And thank you so much for moderating this conversation today on the I Irish Civil War, which isn't an easy conversation to have in Ireland, um, never mind here in, in, in the United States, you know? Um, and so I hope that by the end of the, the conversation today, we'll all have to, um, a few more perspectives on how we can approach reflecting uh, on those events. But I'm gonna leave uh, every, all of our guests now in, in your capable hands, Jonathan, and, um, and thank you very much. Good evening, Mahagai, Claire, Agus, Laurie, Agus, Faltero, Leno. Welcome everybody to today's event. Um, as we approach the end of the Ambassadors series, reflecting on the War of Independence, as well as the Irish President series, Machn of 100, exploring an ethical commemoration of the events we now remember in this decade of centenaries, we have the task today of discussing the Irish Civil War. Traditionally understood as owing its origins to the split that emerged in Irish polity following the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty, the Irish Civil War was a conflict that lasted from June 1922 to May 1923. The two oppositional parties that emerged from the splitting of Sinn Féin, now known as Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, became the dominant political parties in post-independence politics. And in a phenomenon known as civil war politics, the Taoiseach, or Irish Prime Minister, and the leader of the opposition have always come from one of these two parties. The long political shadow cast by the Irish Civil War is summarized in the political quandary of these two parties agreeing to form a coalition government uh, together for the first time only last year. Popularly known in the Irish language as Cogan the War of Friends, some of the complex dynamics that inform historiographic accounts of the Civil War are explored in the literary works of uh, Sean O'Casey, Ernie O'Malley, W.B. Yeats, uh, to name a few. The literary representations of the burning of Anglo-Irish owned big houses was foreshadowed in Elizabeth Bowen's The Last September. This theme was recently re uh, returned to recently in Durin Nigrefa's Another Planter's Daughter, a masterful poetic reworking of and inversion of the gaze in Austin Clarke's The Planter's Daughter. The most well-known cinematic adaptation of Civil War themes, Ken Loach's The Wind That Shakes the Barley, reinvigorated the socialist narrative of the Civil War. Small by European standards, the loss of life is now thought to be approximately 1,500 people, a fraction of the 30,000 lives lost in the Finnish Civil War. The Irish conflict exposed existing division within an apparent uh, solidarity fostered by the common objective of independent statehood, bequeathing a legacy of political distrust and seething resentment, which would have a lasting effect on Irish society and demographics, as well as setting the tone for the future of Irish politics and government. Irish historiography has tended to privilege accounts of the political division over the treaty, the killing of high profile figures such as Cahal Brua, Michael Collins, Erskine Childers and Kevin O'Higgins, uh, as well as local history accounts of skirmishes in the Irish counties where the fighting was most prominent. Contemporary scholarship has both addressed underrepresented aspects of the Irish Civil War and contributed to our understanding of the complex matrix of dynamics underlying the political grievance and violence in the conflict. Gavin Foster reconceptualizes class debates from the conflict, emphasizing social status in Irish society as a key factor in the contestation between opponents. His innovative methodological approach takes, for example, the sartorial customs of the opposing factions as one of the primary sources in building his analysis of social status, bringing a new perception to the traditional narratives of the Civil War. Gemma Clark's work has brought to the fore the violence encountered and perpetrated by non-combatants in the conflict, illuminating previously neglected aspects of sectarianism and historical agrarian grievance, which manifested themselves at the local level in terms of intimidation, arson, 
boycott, animal maiming, sexual and gender-based violence, assault and murder. We hope that your knowledge and understanding of the complexities of the Irish Civil War is enriched by hearing more about their innovative research today. In terms of format, I will introduce each scholar before their 15-minute presentation. We will then have a response from Ambassador Nahir and Dan Mulhall and discussion between our presenters and the ambassador before opening the floor to questions. We encourage you to post your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and time permitting, we will get to as many questions as possible. Uh, Dr. Gavin Foster is Associate Professor of Irish History in the School of Irish Studies, Concordia University in Montreal, Canada. His book, uh, which I have here, uh, the Irish Civil War and Society, Politics, Class and Conflict, was awarded the American Conference for Irish Studies 2015 James S. Donnelly Senior Prize for Books on History and Social Sciences. He has published articles and essays in uh, The Atlas of the Irish Revolution, Kerry History and Society, Field Day Review, Seher, Journal of Irish Labour History, uh, Era Ireland, Journal of Irish Studies, New Hibernia Review, History Ireland and the Revolution Papers, among others. He is currently writing a study of the Irish Civil War and revolutionary memory based on extensive oral history interviews and research conducted with funding from the government of Quebec. Today, he will be presenting on conflict and memory, Ireland's civil war. Hello, all right. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Jonathan. So um, first, I would like to thank the organizers, uh, Direct Director Laurie Gallagher and Jonathan O'Neill at the University of St. Thomas's William J. Flynn Center for Irish Studies, um, Irish Ambassador to the US, Daniel Mulhall, the Consul General of Ireland in Austin, Clara McCarthy, their staffs, and as an historian of the 1922 to 1923 treaty split and Irish Civil War that simultaneously terminated Ireland's revolution and birthed the independent Irish state, it is gratifying to take part in the Farther Shore series, along with Dr. Gemma Clark, to discuss these seismic changes in modern Irish history on the eve of their centenary. My past work on the period has included attention to suppressed social fissures and political conflicts within Irish nationalism and Irish society more generally um, to, uh, that were exposed and intensified by the fallout over controversial settlement with Britain in 1921. The split in the Sinn Féin movement over the Anglo-Irish Treaty, which conferred dominion status to a partitioned Ireland rather than recognizing the 32-county republic aspired to by many independence activists, rapidly metastasized into a full-blown civil war, sowing divisions, controversies, animosities, and silences that inflected Southern Irish politics, social life, and communal memory for decades. It's impossible, obviously, to compress the history and meaning of these momentous developments into a short talk. So my goal today is to offer some context and historical observations while reflecting on the fraught memory of the internationalist conflict that formed the Irish state, as it's sometimes known. Now to start, I thought it would be worth considering what was happening in Ireland exactly 100 years ago. In the month of May 1921, the Irish Republican Army's guerrilla campaign against Crown forces, which was waged in conjunction with the underground Republican government's administrative and diplomatic efforts to supplant British rule, was well over two years old. Although a formal truce was less than two months away, the War of Independence had entered its deadliest phase, with lethal ambushes by IRA flying columns, orchestrated military roundups and reprisals, mounting civilian casualties, mass internment, executions, and martial law in the rebel heartland of Munster. On this day, uh, May 21st of 1921, for example, local IRA battalions attacked a party of Royal Marines passing through Ballyvaughan County Clare, killing two and seriously wounding two more, while four days later, the Dublin battalions launched a more ambitious assault on the Custom House at the cost of heavy casualties and scores of captured volunteers. While narratives of the War of Independence typically focus on Republican insurgency in the past, this was also the moment when Northern Ireland was partitioned from the rest of the island. The May 24th elections in the six counties producing heavy unionist victories, followed by the formal opening of the devolved Northern Irish Parliament by King George V on the 22nd of June. Effectively setting into motion 50 years of one party unionist rule in the six counties, the King used the occasion to publicly communicate renewed peace feelers to Sinn Féin, culminating in a formal truce between the IRA and the British government on July 11th, 1921. 
While met in many places with spontaneous celebrations and parades in honor of local heroes who could now come out of hiding, the truce did not constitute an ambiguous victory for the Republican cause, nor did it produce a total cessation of violence as evidenced by serious incidents in the South, such as the murky IRA reprisals against Protestants, loyalists in Cork's Bandon Valley in early 1922, as well as ongoing paroxysms of paramilitary state and communal violence that attended partition in the North. The so-called forgotten Northern conflicts that rage intermittently between 1920 and 1922 still resists inclusion in popular nationalist narratives and commemorations of Ireland's complex revolutionary process. Some would call it Ireland's other civil war. Now we can appreciate in retrospect that mid to late 1921 marked the crucial juncture when the decade long nationalist revolution pivoted from its heroic phase, which was the four glorious years of shared national struggle initiated by the 1916 Easter Rising to its messy denouement. To borrow revolutionary veteran and writer Frank O'Connor's phrase, it was during this final phase that his generation's quote unquote romantic improvisation was torn asunder by the harsh realities of partition, compromise, internecine violence, and state formation. Put another way, the temporizing policy of independence first, everything else after, that held Sinn Féin's ideologically diverse cross-class coalition together during the dark days of struggle against crown forces was no longer sustainable when fighting paused and a settlement was in, within reach. Among the internal tensions that erupted to the surface were the power struggle between the political and military wings of the independence movement and within the military wing between the Dublin-based leadership and provincial fighters protective of their autonomy. Temporarily swollen by fair weather truceleer recruits, the post-truce IRA experienced growing indiscipline and strange relations with civilians. Local commanders also warily regarded the growing prominence of politicians in the movement. As court fighter Michal Osulawin recalled ominously, quote, I heard a prophecy made by a member of the flying column. He foretold the coming of the truce, the return of the politician, and a civil war. For their part, the administrators in the movement were eager to assert greater civilian control over the IRA and to pursue a political path forward, even if that meant flexibility towards some revolutionary goals. Signed in London on the 6th of December, 1921, the 18 Articles of Agreement for a Treaty between Great Britain and Ireland involved compromises by both sides, but with its acceptance of partition and the principle of imperial loyalty embedded in the Dominion Settlement for 26 counties, it arguably entailed more concessions from the Irish side. Signatories and prominent proponents of the treaty, including incipient statesmen Michael Collins, W.T. Cosgrave, and Kevin O'Higgins, stressed the largely symbolic nature of most concessions to Great Britain against the concrete gains secured by the new Irish Free State, as it was known. These included its own executive, parliament, courts, and civil service, albeit modeled on and largely made up of pre-revolutionary employees, its own army with IRA veterans at its core, and fiscal autonomy, and all of it which could be achieved without further death or destruction. With the Commonwealth evol evolving towards further independence of its member states, arguments for using the treaty as a quote-unquote stepping stone to fuller external sovereignty would prove prescient. The anti-treaty faction led by Eamon de Valera, and that was dominated by IRA and Come and Demon activists, balked at the bitter sacrifices of principle inherent in a settlement that kept Ireland in the empire and recognized the British crown in an oath of allegiance and, the, and in the position of governor general. Moreover, given Ireland's propinquity, as Erskine Childers was uh, inclined to say, which means its geographic uh, proximity to the UK, and the Royal Navy's continued access to several Irish ports and installations, critics likened the new state's apparent freedom to a form of parole granted to a prisoner uh, that was revocable at the whim of his warden, a critique with affinities to what has been called the neoclassical Republican conception of liberty as freedom from domination or interference by the arbitrary will of another. Of course, behind the high-minded philosophical arguments for, against, for and against the treaty, other overlapping motives and considerations influenced attitudes in the split. From leadership squabbles and power struggles to class and status considerations to economic interests, including further pat future patronage and jobs uh, for movement veterans to age, gender, geographical, and other variables. This cocktail of ideological, personal, social, and contingent influences on allegiances and the chaotic character of much civil war violence are why attempts to find a straightforward political or social logic to the civil war split have proven elusive. 
Um, although binary models of Democrats versus dictators or stake in the country on one side versus men of no property on the other remain popular interpretations. Given pre-existing tensions in the independence movement and the pressures and constraints under which the treaty was negotiated and debated, a divided reaction among the Sinn Féin movement was probably unavoidable. And here I think it's obligatory for me to reference Brendan Behan's uh, famous quip that the split is the first uh, item on the agenda of any Irish organization. Uh, but this is not to say that the ensuing civil war was inevitable. Contingency played a crucial role in the fluid six months between the, the Dáil's narrow ratification of the treaty and the provisional government's opening assault on the anti-treaty held four courts complex on the 28th of June, 1922. Arguably, it was Britain's looming threat of quote unquote, immediate and terrible war if the settlement failed, plus its arming, funding and pressuring of treatyites to face down the armed opposition that ultimately pushed the nationalist fracture to the point of open warfare. And it's interesting to note that uh, that leading treatyites from the political wing of the movement, like Arthur Griffith and Kevin O'Higgins, were considerably more eager to take the offensive against Republicans than many pro-treaty military figures like Commander-in-Chief Michael Collins, who engaged in intensive behind-the-scenes efforts to heal the split within the IRA, even after hostilities were underway. Now, within months of the short but sharp opening battle for the capital, the nascent National Army had secured most towns throughout the 26 counties, and the provisional government was assuming de facto political control over the country. Nevertheless, the bitter conflict dragged on until May of 1923, as the Republican rearguard waged a desperate guerrilla campaign, only this time in divided, more divided communities and without a functional political wing beyond propagandists and uh, prison protests. Former friends and comrades in arms became enemies, as did neighbors and even family members. In some cases, it was literally a war of brothers. Though countless others attempted to stay neutral, a posture regarded with suspicion and contempt by partisans on both sides. While a comparatively restrained civil war in terms of its duration and total casualties, the intimate conflict was proportionately more violent than the longer war of independence, while its catalog of self-inflicted horrors deeply shocked the country out of a virtuous, heroic national image that had been cultivated in revolutionary culture. The tragic deaths of leading figures such as Collins, Arthur Griffith, Liam Mellows, Erskine Childers, and others extended mass internment and more executions in seven months than were performed by the British in six years. A costly campaign of destruction, plus trap mines, ambushes, and assassinations by Republicans, free state atrocities in the Kerry Command, scores of extrajudicial killings elsewhere, and popular resistance to police and state authority amidst an explosion of agrarian and labor unrest, property attacks, violent assaults, crime, and acts of intimidation by indeterminate actors with often unclear motives. These were among the defining features of the paradoxical war of friends that traumatized and embittered losers and winners, combatants and civilians alike. While the Free State ultimately vanquished the anti-treaty IRA, Republicans uh, merely dumped their arms rather than formally surrender, and thus the fundamental crisis of political legitimacy remained, reflected in the results of the August 1923 election, which showed significant anti-treaty sentiment, especially in parts of the West. Many thousands of Republican internees remained in custody for the rest of, the, uh, of 1923, while the Free State Army harried on-the-run fighters, pursued criminal prosecutions of some prisoners, and arrested fugitive political leaders, including De Valera himself. Released in dribs and drabs in late fall after an abortive mass hunger strike, a wave of Republican ex-prisoners and activists immigrated over the next few years, mostly to the United States, driven out by endemic rural poverty, as well as ongoing political persecution and blacklisting. The aftermath of the Civil War was a transitional period of state building and social reconstruction for the Cosgrave government, as it politely pushed against the constitutional constraints on Ireland sovereignty while drawing closer to the church and decommissioning radical residues of the revolution from populist Sinn Féin courts to Griffithian economic autarky to left labor and feminist influences. The advent of the Fianna Fáil party in 1926, which was de Valera's off-ramp from Sinn Féin's principled but self-negating abstentionist policy, quickly attracted broad-based populist support. Its rapid growth helped to enshrine the fundamental civil war divide rather than a left-right ideological division in Southern party politics that, alas that lasted essentially until last year when the first ever Fianna Fáil Fine Gael coalition with the Green Party came to office. Now, first winning office in 1932, the slightly constitutional 
Dana Foyle party sought to republicanize the state by unilaterally undoing key features of the treaty settlement, ultimately helping to put the state on a revised foundation that was more acceptable to both dominant civil war parties and the constituencies. Though this did not reconcile more militant Republicans for whom partition rendered both states on the island illegitimate, nor did it impress other political minorities from feminists to Protestants to leftists who objected to the socially conservative clericalist status quo that was further entrenched in this period. But the successful transmutation of the Civil War divide from zero-sum conflict to Pacific parliamentary politics did not entail a national reconciliation, which has arguably never taken place. The troubled memory or anti-memory of the conflict persisted, variously likened to an unexercised ghost, an unhealed wound, or visible scars on the body politic. Even decades later, the Civil War could be glimpsed in animosities that animated many political, personal, family, and communal rifts, in selective and partisan accounts and commemorations, and most of all, in layers of silence and efforts at forgetting that have been called a conspiracy of silence engaged in by individual veterans, families and communities touched by the war, rival political parties, and the state itself. Now, going back to antiquity, civil wars have been regarded as uniquely traumatic and tragic conflicts, reflecting no doubt the fact that they resist the social practice of remembering in common that allows nations to find shared meaning in wars against outsiders, whether won or lost, and other collective struggles and catastrophes. The polarized positions in the split and civil war necessarily resulted in sharply divergent memories and counter narratives that could not be easily reconciled. Blame, anger, and enmity were natural byproducts, as were guilt, shame, and sadness, explaining the seesaw between eruptions of heated emotion, especially at election time in the 1920s and 30s, but occasionally well beyond, and their widespread repression and collective silence. Paradoxically, the winners of the conflict generally evinced more discomfort with publicly remembering their role in the period, with very little official effort to permanently or continuously memorialize, much less celebrate, their victory and successful defense of the state in 1922 and 23, uh, outside of free state, uh, the Free State Army plot in Glasnevin and the, the annual pilgrimage to the ambush spot where Michael Collins fell. Republicans were much more active and self-assured in commemorating their dead Though the faction who embraced Fianna Foyle were challenged by smaller, less compromising Republicans for custodianship of the tradition from the 1930s on. In lieu of a shared national narrative of commemorative tradition, small groups of veterans, families of the dead, and local grassroots memorial committees have long presided over micro traditions of remembrance of local Republican heroes and martyrs, with little tolerance for free state memory and sometimes even hostility to uh, Fianna Foyle participation. The former can be seen by recent acts of vandalism against the rare Free State Memorial erected to several soldiers lured to their deaths at Not Negotial in North Kerry, while divisions within anti-treaty memory are reflected in a lengthy legal dispute between two politically estranged cousins who are descendants of a Republican martyr for control over the Clash Milken Caves Memorial on the edge of the North Kerry coast. Separate Sinn Féin and Fianna Foyle memorials were ultimately necessary to resolve the matter. But most veterans simply avoided public engagement with the memory of the divisive post-truce period, as can be seen by the tendency for IRA memoirs and revolutionary accounts to end artificially at the truce, even when their authors were active in the events of 1922 and 23. The same evasive periodization was adopted for the state's Bureau of Military History project. Now, with the centenary of these fraught events falling next year and the year following, it raises the urgent question. Can or should this long, bitter history of partisan remembrance, political animosities, shared silences, and a scarcity of reconciliation finally be overcome with a national ceremony of nonpartisan remembrance? In oral history interviews that I've conducted around 2012 uh, to 2015 for an ongoing project on Civil War memory, I pose this question to numerous interviewees whose parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and other relations took part in or lived through the Civil War. I encountered a range of opinions on the matter, from those protective of the Republican tradition's monopoly on Civil War commemoration, who opposed the involvement of the state or historically pro-treaty parties, to those from either political tradition who feel it's still necessary to let sleeping dogs lie with minimal or no official effort, effort to revisit this painful period, to finally many across the inherited Fianna Foyle, Fianna Gael divide who are supportive of a national centenary commemoration as long as it's quote unquote inclusive, appropriate, and sensitive 
language that echoes the formal principles of the expert group advising the government's decade of centenaries program, and which for some can be taken as kind of a code for making sure that the, proceeding, the proceedings are not quote unquote hijacked by current Republican parties or agendas. Now this past April, the Irish government publicized draft plans for commemorating 2022 and 2023, uh, along with archival releases and support for various local initiatives, academic discussions and museum exhibitions, it recommended commemorating the foundation of the state amidst civil war by marking the anniversary of the historic handover of Dublin Castle on January 16th, 1922, and the formal establishment of the free state in its constitution on December 6th of that year. Then on a more neutral date yet to be revealed, it envisaged uh, the holding of a quote, ceremony of remembrance and reconciliation in remembrance of all of those who lost their lives during the Civil War. The less than neutral dates chosen for the former plan may not be palatable to those who hold alternative views on the chronology of independent statehood, while the latter more ecumenical reconciliatory gesture is complicated by the largely unacknowledged legacy of state violence in the Civil War and the awkward fact that many victims were also perpetrators of violence. So we'll have to wait then for the near future to see if the present is the right time for Ireland to lay these ghosts of the past to rest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Some very interesting themes there on uh, reconciliation, uh, commemoration, and the, the haunting silence that permeates narratives, uh, or some of the narratives on the Irish Civil War that we may pick up again in the uh, question and answer session. Um, but first we'll turn to uh, Dr. Gemma Clark. Dr. Gemma Clark is Senior Lecturer in British and Irish History at the University of Essex with research and teaching specialisms in violence. Her first book, uh, Everyday Violence in the Irish Civil War, examines the conflict over the Anglo-Irish Treaty. She has also published on sectarianism, gender-based violence and arson in outlets including the Irish Times, Irish Historical Studies and the Atlas of the Irish Revolution. Gemma is currently writing a global history of arson and has received British Academy funding for a related project, Exporting Arson, Incendiarism as Protest in the Global Irish Diaspora, which uses case studies from the USA and Australia to explain why malicious burning is deployed more intensively in some conflicts and movements than others. Today, she will be presenting on women's interactions with the Irish Civil War, gender-based harm and perspective. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for the introduction. And as you can see, the, uh, the flavour of my recent research is very international in perspective. So it's it's really wonderful to be addressing friends and colleagues in, in the US, Canada uh, and around the world at the moment. And thank you so much to Jonathan Laurie at the, the Flint Centre, as well, of course, the, the Consul General Claire, Cecilia and all her staff, and not to mention the Ambassador, uh, Daniel Mahal. It's wonderful to be here. I'll get right into it. Gender-based violence is the targeting of individuals or groups on the basis of their gender. It takes many forms, physical, emotional, psychological and sexual, and can be perpetrated by and against people of any gender, but women and girls are the primary victims. My focus today is conflict-related gender-based violence, which I'll call GBV in this talk, to which women and girls are also particularly vulnerable. Perpetrators, on the other hand, who might be state or non-state actors, soldiers or civilians, but are nearly always men, have historically benefited from the climate of impunity rampant during war. Recently, however, in the wake of war and genocide in the former Yugoslavia, international organisations have challenged the implicit acceptance of GBV as unavoidable. A consensus has emerged since the 1990s among academics and policymakers and prosecutors that violence against women serves military strategy by spreading fear, breaking up families and communities, and thereby diminishing civilian resistance to the will of the attacking force. There are sadly numerous examples of rape as war in the 20th century, and sexual violence remains prevalent in contemporary conflicts, Syria, DRC, and other places where organisations like the UN uh, focus their work. Within this international context of research and activism, I've been studying women's experiences of the Irish Civil War, a conflict on which I've published extensively and 
Jonathan and Gavin have already provided uh, wonderful summaries. My first book, Everyday Violence in the Irish Civil War, looks at how the struggle over the Anglo-Irish Treaty played out in local communities, focusing especially on religion and politics as lines of demarcation between Irish people. My new research examines gender as an identifier in violent processes of community regulation, of defining self from other, friend from enemy, during the revolution in Ireland's governance. And this is one of the many ways I think that my talk fits with, with Gavin's in terms of how these divisions are, are seen and, and processed and, and can really be so traumatic. So I'm talking about gender. I'm concerned primarily with female non-combatants while also acknowledging that civilian is a problematic category in civil war, especially not to mention that Irish women played militant roles during Ireland's conflict throughout from the war of from 1916 Easter Rising through the war of independence in, in, into the civil war. We know, uh, as has already been said, that Ireland's civil war took a heavy toll on the civilian population. Estimates are around 573 non-combatants were killed, so that's out of the total of around 1,500 casualties mentioned by Jonathan. Many thousands more suffered physical and psychological trauma, financial hardship, disruption to daily life, as, national tr as the national troops of the nascent Free State clashed with anti-treaty Republicans over the independence settlement with Britain, and non-combatants fought their own battles over land identity politics. My first question then is, how dangerous was this civil war for women specifically? To answer this, I use the recently opened records of the Compensation Personal Injuries Committee in the National Archives of Ireland in Dublin and other sources to build a picture of the types and intensity of interpersonal violence suffered by women. I found that 60% of claims made to the CPIC, this Personal Injuries Committee, by or on behalf of women, related to non-lethal physical harm, typically wounds, both accidental and deliberate, from gunshots or bombs, though there are also recorded conflict-related tra road traffic accidents and assaults without a weapon. The files also document the psychological impact on victims of physical injury. Mary Hyde's nerves are shattered, for example, after being knocked unconscious by debris from a mine explosion in St Mary's Hall, Cork, on the 2nd of March, 1923. And there are a small number of cases, around 12%, that describe mental illness triggered not by physical injury to the woman in question, but seeing violence at close quarters. Mary Gallagher, for example, had a, quote, very severe shock when irregulars, her words, attacked her home in County Roscommon, which was being used presumably by the Free State side as a military post in the Urugna Mountains. A private was killed in the operation and the resultant, quote, sleeplessness and nerves continued for Mary for at least three months. Knowing what happened to women in this way leads us to why. When female civilians are caught in the crossfire of civil war, in intense street battles in Limerick City, for example, their sex is seemingly immaterial. However, there are some more targeted cases that I found in which dubious political loyalties or other forms of betrayal were punished by violence. When a party of irregulars raided the home of Patrick Callanan in Dromoly, Curra Clare, in County Clare at 9 p.m. on the 29th of December, 1922, his daughter May, her boots off as she undressed for bed, was shot and seriously maimed in the foot. It's not clear if the shooter aimed deliberately at the foot, tortured to extract information, or if William Campbell, since arrested for the crime, fired generally in her direction, striking barefooted May. Evidently, the family was known to the assailants, under-resourced and on-the-run anti-treaty Republicans often billeted themselves in private homes, as they had at the Callanans for several nights at a time. May was, quote, suspected of informing the government troops at Kilrush on the whereabouts of Campbell and other irregulars. Women played a key role in intelligence gathering and communications during the Civil War. Evidently, May was not immune from suspicion from anti-treaty forces in her area by virtue of her gender. 
cases like May's where the injury took place on private property remind us of the intimate nature of the Irish Revolution, this, this whole period of conflict from 1912 to 23, and consequently the disproportionate impact of violence on the traditional guardians, women, of the domestic space. And this is an interpretation that's especially relevant in an independent island that would, during subsequent decades of state consolidation, designate explicitly the home as a woman's sphere a designation given legal force by the 1937 Irish constitution, severely curtailing women's economic and social freedoms. And, and Gavin referred to just, just earlier to this post-war period of, of, of state building and the, uh, from my perspective, the, the loss of the promise of feminism and equality that had been contained in, in the 1916 rising is, is a strong feature of, of this period and explains some of the violence and responses to it that I'm talking about. So this idea of women as being being susceptible because they're guardians of the domestic space, in the cases I've studied it was often women who opened the door to violent actors searching for the men of the house, for weapons, for supplies. It was women who sheltered under the kitchen table when, as in the case of Bridget Barry from Bantry, County Cork, machine gun fire and bullets came through the back door. An exchange between pro and anti-treaty troops focused on Bridget's house after she, quote, gave a drink of water to three or four rebels at her front door. She said, whilst there, national troops came in sight and opened fire. As shots continued back and forth, Bridget's daughter, Helena, thrown prostrate under the table, was struck in the left side and died a few weeks later from her wounds in Cork Hospital. Arson, a common wartime tactic, is also notable as an invasion of the domestic space and therefore a tactic that impacts on women um, more fundamentally. The female servant or family member in flight from a burning house, dishevelled, vulnerable, is a familiar motif of the campaign of fire by Republicans against three Bush state authority and symbols of the old British regime. And this is something I write about at some length in my book so if you want to know more you can have a read of that and also um, I've explored these themes of arson in some newer work uh, in a blog post called Forged by Fire which again you can access from my from my staff profile that's been uh, kindly posted in, in the chat. So Irish women suffered in raids, burnings on account of their gender that is socio-cultural expectations that placed women and girls more firmly than men and boys in the home and class you know is another factor here potentially as, as Gavin's work has shown. So they suffered because of their gender but GBV gender-based violence was not used in a systematic way in Ireland to realise political or military objectives in contrast to other guerrilla tactics including arson, attacks on infrastructure, assassination of ex-British servicemen and so forth. So I'm definitely not saying women weren't raped or abused during the Civil War period or longer period of the revolution. I pay tribute to the important research by Linda Connolly, Susan Byrne and others in bringing to light sexual crimes and long hidden traumas. I also acknowledge the problems inherent in enumerating accurately under and often unreported acts including rape, especially in close-knit communities and patriarchal societies. We see this still to this day. Rape is very underreported, under-prosecuted. The, the investigation of a possible case I found of sexual uh, assault in the Civil War is frustrated by um, omissions and obscure language. John Hennigan wrote to the Personal Injuries Committee on behalf of his wife, Mary, in his words, a person of unsound mind, recounting the nighttime attack by armed and masked men that caused a complete breakdown of the nervous system. The raiders, he said, took my three sons and myself out of the house and kept us away for about an hour. Was she trapped in the house with the raiders? Did interpersonal sexual violence result in this trauma? Explained by James. Unfortunately, we simply don't know. Perhaps because the forced cutting of a woman's hair has a much more publicly noticeable outcome. As opposed to the private shame of sexual violation, women were more forthcoming about hair sharing than they were about sexual assault. Hair sharing involves no sexual contact, 
but it's characterised as GBV because it targets a woman for her gender. A woman's hair in various cultures being seen as key to femininity and a potent symbol of sexuality. Its removal, therefore, marks out physically women who have transgressed social or sexual norms by collaboration with the enemy, for example, and the act of cutting thus symbolically defeminizes the target. And Jonathan mentioned the Ken, Lo Ken Loach film, and you might remember that particularly um, horrific scene in The Wind That Shakes the Barley where the character Sinead is uh, viciously attacked in this way by British forces for uh, failing to uh, give information on the whereabouts of the local IRA column. By its visible marking of the target, then, shearing is a tactic of exclusion and punishment seen in other 20th century European conflicts, such as during Fran in France during the Second World War. In Ireland during the War of Independence and Civil War, hair shearing functioned as community regulation, focused specifically on women because of the role they played in that community in providing shelter, support, supplies, information as mothers, shopkeepers, housekeepers, and so on. Anne White, for example, was a middle-aged housekeeper in the service of a Catholic priest, Murphy, in Clodov, Crookstown, in County Cork. On the night of 24th of April, 1923, Father Murphy's house was raided by a number of armed men who seized and dragged by force Anne into the yard where they assaulted her. Murphy, the priest, and Anne's sister Mary, also a servant, remonstrated with the raiders, but they were threatened with revolvers and Mary badly dragged about and assaulted which according to the compensation claim I've read, which naturally emphasizes uh, the financial impact, resulted in lasting physical and mental damage, rendering her unable to care for elderly parents. After this altercation at the house, Anne White was forced into a motor car by the raiders and taken away to an unoccupied house four or five miles distance. She was detained there for some time during which her hair was cut off and she was warned not to return to Clodov. We might interpret the targeting of his female servant as an attack on the authority of the priest, Murphy, and with it, the ability of the church to protect norms on the place of women in the institution and society more widely. Perhaps Murphy had acted in some way contrary to the local IRA, speaking out as some in the, in the church hierarchy did against civil war violence. However, overall anti-clericalism and abuses of religious personnel were largely absent in Ireland. A notable difference from other civil conflicts, for example, the Spanish Civil War. In fact, Ireland's religious structures and well-established gender relations might actually explain the relative scarcity of more extreme interpersonal and sexual violence in this conflict. Shaped strongly by the socio-cultural tenets of Catholicism, increasingly dominant in the age of the free state, arguably militants didn't need to use extreme violence to establish boundaries between powerful men and subservient women, a dynamic that served, in Ireland's case, state consolidation on the one hand, on the free state side, and the upholding of an alternative republican identity on the other. Given the lesser importance of gendered power relations then as compared to national, political or religious loyalties in the Irish Revolution, it's possible that Anne White of Crookstown, the, the priest's uh, housekeeper, I just talked about, was targeted for her wartime loyalties, albeit with a tool appropriate to her gender. The press reported a local allegation that Anne had given information to Canon Treaty parish priest as to the movements of armed men, possibly the same men that later attacked her. And the warning she received not to return to Clodov, its severity underlined by the violence of the hair cutting, is reminiscent of threats issued against men, also during the Civil War. Revolutionary Ireland evidently was not a safe place for many Irish women, nor indeed for some men, and personal security may have had more to do with one's domestic environment than the military situation. Still today, the most dangerous place for women is the home, of the 87,000 women intentionally killed in 2017, 58% were killed by intimate partners or family members. It's similarly important to place women's interactions with the Irish Civil War in the context of 1920s attitudes towards motherhood, marriage, and opportunities 
or lack thereof for female agency in employment, reproduction and so forth. Women's experiences of violence were distinctive from men's on account of their gender because of the prevalence during 1922 to three of modes of violence and intimidation, including crimes against property, which transgressed public private boundaries. Yet by placing Ireland's conflict in comparative international perspective and aiming to understand the extent and function of violence against women, my research underlines histories by Mary Coleman and others on the relative scarcity of systematic sexual as opposed to gender violence in Ireland's revolution. Rape is a weapon of war and a crime against humanity. The genocidal aims underlying conflict related GBV elsewhere in the world were absent in Ireland, where gendered power structures shored up by Catholic authority remained largely unshaken by the revolution and civil war, despite the efforts of some radical females. Thanks. Um, fascinating to hear personal testimony from, uh, from those compensation claims uh, of, of how this particular violence affected women. And interesting also, we may address uh, some of the silences around it in the Q&A session uh, afterwards. But first, I would like to call on the ambassador on here, the ambassador of Ireland to Washington DC to respond to the presentations and uh, offer his thoughts on what we have been discussing so far. Good morning, Margaret Jonathan. I guess so. It's over Austin. We have shown you can learn more on over topic to show. It's a really a pleasure to be um, with you uh, this afternoon to talk about the Irish Civil War and its legacy. Because of course, I represent um, the Irish state here in the United States, and therefore um, the institutions that have developed that I have served for the last. 40 plus years are a product of that period of um, the coming of Irish independence, which of course was accompanied by a, uh, a rather tragic uh, event called the Irish Civil War. So just a few reflections and thank you uh, to, um, to Gavin Foster, uh, to Gemma Clark, uh, and to yourself, Jonathan, and of course to Laurie Gallagher and the continent for organizing this uh, discussion of the Irish Civil War. Um, for me, at least, um, I look at the period as a whole between 1916 and 1923. And what I see in that period of just seven years, a short period of time, really, in most um, contexts. But in Ireland, that period of time resulted in, produced an extraordinary transformation of a political status quo that had after all survived for more than 120 years when it came to an end, that is the Act of Union, when it was brought to an end in 1922 by the creation of the Irish Free State. So what's always intrigued me is how did Ireland manage to pull this off? A revolution uh, conducted against the might of one of the successful powers of the Great War, one of the victorious countries that emerged from the Great War, from the First World War, victorious, triumphant. And here you had a, a local revolutionary grouping under the banner of Sinn Féin that was able to force the British government to eventually concede a form of independence uh, to Ireland. And then we had the tragedy of the treaty split and the ensuing civil war. So my sense is that one of the issues, one of the problems that the Ireland of 100 years ago had to confront was that the, the movement that delivered Irish independence was a big tent movement. It was a movement that emerged rather suddenly. Okay, it had roots in the Sinn Féin party of, of the early part of the 20th century. It had roots in the, in the uh, Irish Republican Brotherhood uh, um, and, and the Irish Volunteers that brought about the Easter Rising. But it came together pretty quickly after the release of the prisoners who were interned following the Easter Rising. 
so it didn't have time to to work out its its, its political platform in any um, deliberate way. Everything was done on the hoof, it seems to me. And a good example of that is the fact that um, the Declaration of Independence issued in January 1919 by the first Doyle was written about three weeks after the elections that created the Sinn Féin majority and that made it clear that the first Doyle was going to be dominated by those who are looking for more than home rule for a version of independence for a republic of some kind. The second thing about that group of people, the suddenness of the, uh, their, their ascent to power as the elite of the new, the, you know, the emerging in independent Ireland in 1921 after the, uh, the ceasefire and, and as we moved into the period of the negotiations with Britain about the, uh, the treaty, which eventually was agreed in December 1921. The second thing about these people, apart from the fact that they were in a whirlwind situation, is that they were very young. None of them had very much experience of anything beyond perhaps local government in the case of people like, like, um, uh, like William Cosgrave, uh, who became the uh, Taoiseach eventually when, when Griffith and Collins uh, were taken away uh, in, the, uh, in um, uh, the summer of, of 1922. Um, he had some experience of local government, but apart from that, these were these were young men. They were men uh, in almost all cases, uh, in all cases, effectively, because okay, Konstantin Markovitch was a, a member of the original government for a short while, but nonetheless, they were young men, and they were they had little experience, little or no experience, and they were up against the might of the British Empire, and they were up against the some of the wiliest politicians ever to uh, draw breath in Winston Churchill and Lloyd George. So for me at least, it was sadly perhaps inevitable that the Big Tent movement would sunder once we got close to uh, the moment when decisions had to be made and compromises had to be made between the ideals that were there and the practicality of what could be achieved. And the treaty was a reflection of that compromise. And it was a compromise that wasn't acceptable to a significant slice of those who had fought for Irish independence during our Anglo-Irish war. So now I, I, I'm not saying that, obviously I, I'm a civil servant, so pragmatic um, policy is, is in, in my character, it's in my professional makeup, but I don't um, in any way deride the idealism of those who who saw themselves as having a more a spiritual um, commitment and dedication to the idea of a republic. But you did have a struggle in the 1920s between those who wanted to get down to the business of running the new state and those who were troubled by the fact that that new state was not what it was cracked up, what, what they hoped it would be cracked up to be. Now, the second point about the Civil War is that um, on the global scale, as I think um, Gavin Foster mentioned, it was not particularly destructive. Between one and 2,000 deaths. It's a lot, of course. Um, and it happened in the space of nine months so, or 10 months. So it's a, a lot of death in that short period of time. But if you compare it with, with um, civil conflicts uh, elsewhere in the world, even at that time around Europe, uh, the level of destruction was relatively, relatively, uh, the level of death and destruction was relatively modest. Uh, and the reason for that, I think, was that you didn't have an ethnic divide. In other words, okay, there are some examples of, of, of Protestants being attacked in different parts of Ireland, that's true, and that was uh, sad and, and unjustifiable, un unforgivable. But by and large, the Irish saw themselves as a single people. And most of them were in favor of the treaty. And therefore, the Republicans who fought against the treaty eventually came to realize that unlike the Anglo-Irish War, the War of Independence, where the volunteers, the IRA, uh, had the support, tacit and active support, of a very large part of the population. In the Civil War, people were not committed to the Republican cause in the way they had been committed to the cause of Irish independence prior to 1922. And, you know, one of the things that I would like to 
to say as well is that, of course, the Civil War divide in Ireland was long lasting and sad because of the destruction and death that I've mentioned. And, you know, in particular, the, you know, the executions that uh, were that took place, which were very difficult to to find any justification for either then or now. But it did actually structure Irish politics in a way that provided a kind of a duality, provided a choice between Fianna Fáil after 1926 and Fine Gael or Common Gael um, in its different uh, names. So it, it, it did pattern Irish politics in a way that helped us to avoid some of the more exotic ideological extremes that emerged and that destroyed Europe eventually in the 1930s and 40s in the run-up to and during the Second World War. So the fact is that despite the, the bitterness of the Civil War split, the key moment in Irish history for me was 1932, 10 years after the Civil War, when the victors of that war handed power over to the people they had defeated 10 years before. And that did not result in the Commonwealth government that had ordered the execution of, of so many of the comrades of those who took power in 1932. There wasn't re massive retaliation against people who had been involved in the Commonwealth government. It was a peaceful transition of power. There was some disruption for the first couple of years with the Army Comrades Association and the Blue Shirts, but that quickly petered out. So the actual Civil War divide uh, while it, it may have frozen Irish politics in some way, it did avoid some of the, the more troubling ideological divides that struck Europe in the 1920s and 30s, and that resulted in far more bloodshed than was ever to occur in Ireland. And one of the things that we can be happy about is the fact that we can now look back on 100 years of democracy, that even though our democracy our, that started its life in 1922 was racked by civil war for the first year, by divisions and then civil war for the first year and a half of its existence. That democracy stood the test of time and became a stable democracy that could give an example to the world in many ways. And then finally, I want to take up just briefly, um, and we can discuss this in, in the discussion, but uh, Gavin's comment about a conspiracy of silence. Uh, I would be more inclined to think of it as a culture of constructive avoidance of difficult issues. Because I remember my own background growing up in Waterford in the 1950s and 60s. My parents were supporters of Fianna Fáil. Uh, but I don't remember any bitterness directed towards anybody from the other side of the Civil War divide. It was a divide, certainly, but it didn't divide people. It divided them over the politics, over who they voted for every four or five years. But it didn't cause them to live separate lives or to ghettoize themselves into different areas where they were hostile. People lived and worked together. I mean, my father, uh, I mean, was a member of Fianna Fáil. He was active locally in the politics, but he didn't have any, he didn't bear any grudge or any bitterness against uh, the people on the other side of that Civil War divide. My grandmother, who was who was in who was around during the Civil War, and her brothers were involved in the, the one, and my my grandfather on um, uh, her husband, who died in the sixties. But my grandmother into the she lived into the nineteen nineties, and she sometimes would growl about someone. Oh, they were free staters, and my mother would always tell her not to talk like that because it was a, a subject that wasn't uh, productive of of um, comfortable conversation. So I don't think there's anything particularly wrong about constructive avoidance and trying to develop your society, not, not by ignoring the past, but by trying to be constructive about how you, how you avoid some of the more difficult issues because they're likely to lead to bitterness and recrimination. So um, I will leave it at that. And just to say finally that the Civil War taught De Valera a lesson. It taught him a lesson that uh, rising in arms against the will of the people as reflected in the government of the day was not a good idea. De Valera, while his 
performance during the Civil War might be might be questioned, might be criticised. Uh, he quickly learned the lesson and decided to go the road of democracy and to win the argument, not by force of arms, but by force of argument and not by bullets, but by the ballot box, which he successfully did and managed to, to undo some of the provisions of the treaty through those efforts during the 1930s. So whatever you, you know, you think about, uh, you know, the civil war, um, it did give rise to a state that became, if you like, an epitome of stability in a world that was racked with conflict and turbulence in the decades that followed the establishment of the Irish Free State in 1922. Thank you very much. Good morning, Mahat, uh, Ambassador. I'd like to ask Dr. Gemma Clark and Dr. Gavin Foster to uh, turn on their cameras again. And um, we may um, pick up on some of the points there. It was an interesting point the Ambassador made about constructive avoidance uh, <laughs> of uh, some of the aspects and narratives of the Irish Civil War. Um, and I was wondering if um, the, the, the broad tent nationalism that the Ambassador also mentioned um, papered over um, effectively papered over uh, divisions that already existed in Irish society. We pick up on this a little bit in your book, I think, Gemma, in terms of agrarian unrest, but specifically, I'm also thinking in terms of the case of uh, Miles Joyce and Mom Trasna, uh, or the burning of Bridget Cleary uh, in, I think, Tipperary. So there's there are a couple of cases there that maybe had undercurrents of uh, agrarian unrest. Um, uh, Gemma, would you like to respond first, maybe? Yeah, I, th I think that um, the ambassador raised a, a really helpful point that speaks to what I was trying to argue, this idea that actually, you know, we as historians love to find the contestation and the difference, but actually there was a lot of agreement and that, and part, and, and that speaks to some of my argument about these two sides were essentially tr sharing the same worldview. Um, and this explains in my research some of the sort of attitudes towards the family, towards women, towards gender that I think shaped, yes, the mistreatment of women, but also explain the, the relative scarcity of, of very brutal violence. On the land issue, I think absolutely, and Gavin's work is really important here as well, seeing some of the social tensions that are hidden, if you like, beneath this, this political split and I think that could again be another reason why in some cases it, in some senses the civil war was fairly restrained because the heat had been taken out of the land issue there'd been something of a silent revolution and and these things that caused these you know Bridget Cleary you mentioned and the Monstrasse um, killings in Kerry uh, they had been to a degree settled by by British land legislation of course there's still poverty and problems remained but I think that's a really helpful way to, for us to think about why this was a fairly contained contained conflict. Interesting. Thank you, Gemma. Gavin, what would your take on uh, and your response maybe to some of the ambassador's points be? Uh, certainly, yeah. I uh, enjoyed the response very much. Um, so just to take up your, uh, I liked your phrase, I wrote it down here, this idea of not so much a conspiracy of silence, but a culture of constructive avoidance of difficult issues. Yeah, I, I would very much agree with the, the phrase conspiracy of silence that I use. It's, uh, it's actually a direct quote, and it's used by Dorothy McArdle in her, you know, famous um, 1924 publication. So, you know, hot off the presses when the Civil War energies were still very much in the air, uh, tragedies of Kerry. And she talks about a conspiracy of silence around parts of Kerry where atrocities had occurred. But of course, in 1924, many people were still interned. There was still a lot of unsettled business and scores and a lot of great political tensions. Over time, however, others have argued that um, an enormous kind of cultural silence kind of descended over the conflict. And, and I, I would absolutely agree that this is to be expected and in many ways has um, completely, um, you know, a constructive function in a lot of way. I, I, I did a lot of interviews for my um, uh, project looking at post-memory or, you know, uh, multi-generational, trans-generational memory of the Civil War. And of course, the, 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 there's a view that silence around the Civil War is so pervasive that maybe an oral history wasn't even possible. And so when I embarked on the project, you know, I, I had to really contend with that. And so the, the subject of silence itself actually is part of the subjects that I'm looking at. So what, for, what forms did it take? Not just how was it broken, but how was it maintained? 
And what I discovered is for a lot of people whose parents and grandparents you know, were directly, intimately involved in the Civil War, they very much did not speak about it, uh, of course, with the younger generations, often very much with an intention of not passing on the bitterness, even if certain political you know, electoral tendencies were very, were, uh, very commonly passed on. Um, and then also uh, in, a, in a group interview in the town of Listowel in, in uh, North Kerry, you know, it was brought to my attention that what very often happened is these emotions would, would uh, sort of erupt at election time. That was very common. And you saw this during the blue shirts, you know, conflicts in the 1930s. But at other times, it was well established that there was sort of a, a space to um, kind of part with your neighbors publicly over politics. But most of the other time when people were living in these small towns and in these country areas where they had personal, social, and economic ties with each other, you know, living in each other's shadows, as you know, the Irish proverb says, it was absolutely necessary to, you know, kind of bury in everyday life a lot of those tensions. At least many, many people did so. So that silence, it, its constructive function, its social function is absolutely um, you know, part of what I, I study when we talk about the legacies and memory of the Civil War. And it's very common in, um, I think it's very common following these kinds of very divisive conflicts. And of course, you know, we can exaggerate the silences around the Civil War and forget how many silences there are around the War of Independence and other events. And a lot of the research and work that's being done in the centenary is bringing to light a lot of the things that people have preferred not to talk about, such as, you know, gender-based violence and, and sectarian conflicts and the like. Um, in, in terms of the agrarian issues, yeah, you know, Gemma makes a really important point that, um, you know, it's widely perceived that a lot of the land um, tensions and conflicts were addressed in the late 19th century land wars. But what's really interesting um, is that at the time of the Land League in the 1870s and 80s, it was possible to have this mass-based unifying um, agrarian movement because it was tenant farmers that could be small tenant farmers, medium-sized tenant farmers directing their, um, their anger at what was seen as an alien aristocracy, as an alien landed class. Once you started providing peasant proprietorship, as it was called, to the Catholic tenant farmers, the remaining land and agrarian and class tensions were more intra-class. So it was medium farmers versus small farmers, land hungry people with no land versus the small farmers. And that's the kind of stuff that exploded in the Civil War. A lot of it was very was grievance oriented in ways that were not um, going to be effectively be, to be harnessed by a nationalist movement. Um, and then it also was fueled by the fact that a lot of veterans, IRA members and the like, expected and wanted land and wanted other resources at the end of the revolution and wondered why people of loyalist um, sympathies or didn't take part in the revolution had plum land, you know, when, when the fighting men, as it was said, didn't. So it brought in all these tensions that were far more corrosive of unity. And that's why it gets so chaotic. And that's the kind of stuff that, you know, I talk about in a, in a chapter on social conflict in my book, and that Gemma talks about extensively throughout her book on uh, ordinary violence, because a lot of it, of course, is expressed around and through agrarian um, uh, grievances in such a, a rural society. Thank you, Gavin. Ambassador, would you like to respond? Well, I mean, you know, just to, I suppose amplifying my point about uh, the uh, you know the politics of Ireland in the the period after the Civil War. I mean, uh, shortly before, um, well, during the War of Independence, and and um, to some extent addressing that, W. B. Yeats wrote about uh, wrote the Second Coming, mm -hmm. and he wrote uh, as follows. Um, Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passion and intensity. My point really is that that actually in Ireland, for all of the fears that Gates had, and remember he was at that time that was not just the, the war of independence starting, but it was also what was happening in Europe. You know the, the sort of you know, the revolution, you know, the Spartacus revolution in Germany and the violence there and the kind of rise of communism and, you know, in Eastern Europe and, and Russia and, and so forth. So, you know, the world looked like a very troubled place. But in fact, in Ireland, whether we like it or not, and some people don't like it, but it's the fact, uh, the center did hold, you know, because these two parties were effectively center parties. Now, I mean, they, they managed to distinguish themselves from each other. But in any sort of, uh, of, of political uh, spectrum mapping, <laughs> they would be pretty much, you know, close enough to each other. 
They had different identities. They saw themselves and still see themselves as different, uh, differently composed and having different kind of roots. But, but in practice, their politics were really pragmatic. And while there was a change in 1932, which people clearly wanted because people voted for it, uh, it wasn't the radical, it wasn't the sort of the, the total turn the world upside down change that some people maybe in advance of the 1932 and 33 elections might have, might have assumed. In other words, there was a great deal of continuity along with elements of change which were, which were um, introduced in order to satisfy the wishes of the electorate at that time. So, so um, you know, the Civil War happened to give us um, by accident, really, um, not by design, by accident, happened to give us a fairly stable uh, political um, um, uh, setup in Ireland, and uh, and 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 eventually um, the evolution of, of of coalition government, which I think is actually quite a good thing because it because it, it means that compromises have to be made, you know, between different points of view, and that that probably you know, the pulling and hauling of that compromise probably does lead to a better. Uh, measure of public policy. Thank you, Ambassador. We may turn just to uh, briefly to some of the questions that we've received in the Q&A section. Um, Gavin, I see you've responded to one of them already, but I may pose that again. Just um, uh, John Mully has asked when the native Irish members of the Royal Irish Constabulary uh, were disbanded after the treaty was signed, were they threatened enough to make them leave? And this is something that you both uh, hit on in your books. Um, uh, Gavin, I think you've mentioned um, Republicans leaving uh, after the Civil War, and, and Gemma, you've uh, uh, written about um, the sectarian aspect of Protestant uh, 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 landowners uh, or, or, or citizens leaving Ireland. So um, perhaps we could uh, briefly just hit on that question. Um, Gemma, would you like to start? Yes, I think I think we see this um, as. Uh, in a targeting of, of representatives of, of British power. So perhaps in, in the War of Independence, they are more concerted campaigns of assassination. What we see more in the Civil War is intimidation. So things like boycotting uh, wives or widows of, of ex-constables. And it does result, and it is difficult to quantify these things because you know the, the nature of intimidation is we never know, and this is a problem we see around the world, why someone leaves, a confluence of, of factors. But um, in, my, in my work, in my book, I certainly found a, a, a bit of a cluster of former RIC in, 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 in cities in England where they would sort of band together almost like expat communities because they had, in a sense, been, been driven out. Their lives had been made difficult through a sort of a, co a, a collection of micro a, a, aggressions, if you like. And um, yeah, of some were able to stay and joined Angola Shikana. Others, you know, moved around into other police forces elsewhere in the empire. But um, absolutely, I think those with representative of the old regime did suffer to a degree. And it does, it, it mixes in with a sectarian question, which is interesting. So it, it's, it's not, you know, it's not this, it's not this ethnic conflict as, as the ambassador rightly says, but it, these things do mix in together Britishness with Britishness or perceived Britishness with other factors. Thank you. And Gavin? Yeah, so I think um, when I was working on the, the Irish Civil War on my book, so not the memory projects, but my, my attempt to understand the social um, kind of uh, forces that, that influenced the Civil War, I, I became very interested in this phenomenon um, about which uh, some had been written by Brian Hanley and, and a few others, but the fact that there was a lot of passing references to all of these anti-treaty um, activists and veterans who were leaving in the 1920s by the thousands and thousands. And I found an extensive uh, body of, of sources, Irish Republican Army sources in the papers of Moss Toomey at UCD and elsewhere, where the IRA, the remnants of the organization were attempting to prevent this from happening because many of them hoped, posited that they could sort of renew their revolution in a few years. So uh, what I think is uh, important with, if you kind of look at that, um, outflow of many Irish Republicans after the Civil War, who, of course, were only uh, one sort of flow within hundreds of thousands of Irish immigrants who left in the 1920s. Um, it's an important way of tying this period of the revolution to the broader history of Irish immigration. Um, and, you know, of course, in the 19th century with the famine and the post-famine period, you have a massive um, hemorrhaging of people from the island. And that was one of the critiques of the Union settlement was that Ireland uh, 
had this quote unquote surplus population that was having to constantly leave the country. Um, and so at the time of the First World War, that outflow was, was disrupted by, uh, you know, by the context of, of the World War. And then uh, at the end of the, of, the, of the First World War, right around the end of the Irish Revolution is when it kind of starts up again. And what we see fascinatingly is at the end of the revolution, there's all the traditional reasons people left the so-called congested districts of the west of Ireland. They left for poverty, they left for opportunity, they followed chain migration patterns, you know, Boston and Cleveland and elsewhere. Um, but they were also leaving for complex political reasons, the kinds of people associated with the garrison who were being harassed and exiled, right? Um, members of the RIC and stuff who, who had uh, compensation packages that were encouraged to leave. And then, you know, various other people who just didn't uh, fit the political mold were, were driven out. And then that on top of all those economic patterns. So it's part of the bigger history of, you know, mass migration from Ireland, but it dovetails in this period with complex um, uh, you know, political forces as well. It's a bit like uh, if you look at Ireland in the 1790s, you know, um, around the time of the, of the United Irish Rising and the Act of Union, and in the wake of the Act of Union, you get a large outflow of people as well. That's similarly both structural and also a response to, you know, more immediate factors. So yeah, that's a big area of, of research. Jem has done tons of work on it. Andy Bielenberg has looked a lot at the um, and John Borganovo and others have looked at the, the departure of, of members of this garrison and members of the, of the Protestant minority community. And then, of course, the, there's the more complex thing of partition, you know, and the Catholic nationalists who fled southward. And then many of the people who left, um, you know, the, the newly partitioned Northern Ireland for other places as well. And I think all that's still being worked on. And related um, to, to that question, we have another question by Mike Joyce, um, which asks about, uh, an international dynamic to all of this. And I think, Gavin, in your book, you mentioned as well as a, a future research uh, topic, the, the involvement of some of the irregulars who had traveled to the US in later um, uh, politics. But um, Mike Joyce's question is, can anyone speak to the extent of the US involvement? In more recent history, US policy has been pro-nation building, especially for democratic republics in a post-World War II world. With the numbers of Irish in America, was there pressure on U.S. officials or was the U.S. under Wilson still trying to practice some kind of isolationism post-World War I? Maybe we could tie that in also to other uh, international, uh, I mean, you know, how, how was the Civil War um, reported or um, dealt with in Commonwealth countries, for instance, um, uh, if, if you have any idea uh, about that? Well, I just, this is a great opportunity for me to mention um, there's a, a really important book that's coming out soon. Um, it's a collection of essays. I, I, have, I have nothing to do with it uh, per se, but it's it's representing this new really kind of transnational turn in the study of the Irish Revolution. And um, uh, Dara Gannon and Fergal McGarry and, and a number of other people are involved in, in these projects. And it's looking at the global dimensions. And so that Wilsonian moment is a huge part of that historiography and discussion of the extent to which um, that the you know Wils uh, the Wilsonian kind of democratic and self determination principles were embraced by lots of groups that he had no intention of applying it to <laughs> that the U.S. government had no intention of you know uh, for Egyptians and Indians and and Irish uh, you know anti uh, colonists uh, and, uh, embracing these principles and they did so there's a lot of really important work that's coming out now with you know just fascinating. Um, uh, comparisons and influences over the, you know, the Irish conflict in the Basques, the Irish conflict in Egyptians and Algerians and, and Koreans, uh, really around the world. So it is an absolute, it's really important global, you know, uh, global moment, but it's, it's not really the uh, focus of, of my work. I mean, uh, I'm sure that uh, the ambassador, both Gemma, um, have, uh, have insights they could offer. So. Yeah, I mean, Gemma, you, you'd like to respond first and then we can turn to the ambassador. Yeah, sure. So I, I think as as, uh, as Gavin notes, this this international stage is where, where a lot of this this played out. So, you know, the doll had the, the first doll of 1919 onwards had ambassadors to Latin America, to the US, to various places. It was so important for De Valera and others to get this international recognition. You know, we think about America in terms of financial support. And indeed, they did have these big rallies where they sent money for for the struggle. But it's also political support and you know if nations are famously imagined communities as as benedict Anderson says what the republican what chevet wanted to do was transition from imagined to real state and to do that you need to have international support so they did send delegates as well to 
1919 peace conference in Paris. They didn't manage to join the League of Nations Island until 1923. But um, I think, as, as Gavin says, there's this wonderful work going on at the moment to really internationalise and contextualise the, the Irish independence struggle. And it is so ironic in a way that this sort of self-determination, the rights of small nations, which had a very specific application in Wilson's mind, actually fueled in many ways an anti-colonial movement. And, you know, speaking to the ambassador's earlier comments about the perseverance of democracy, I think that's, you know, a real success story in Ireland. And perhaps a contrast to other post-colonial states that Ireland inspired to break free from Britain and have been, have suffered problems and, and gone to more extremes politically. So uh, it does come out of this moment of uh, we will get, these small nations will get freedoms, but to get those freedoms, we need others around us to, to recognize us and to, and, to, and to support that. So yeah, that's a, thank you for that question. That was a great one. You know, I think the dynamic, the dynamic on these things is, is, is as follows. It's a case of um, Irish Americans going back to the 19th century, um, back deep into the 19th century, very active in trying to influence uh, policy here in, uh, in Washington and uh, around the country. Um, Irish politicians obviously coming over here in the 19th century in, in, in big numbers. Everyone, there was anyone came over here to, to try and, you know, sort of stir up Irish Americans and, and to use the influence of Irish Americans to, to good effect for Ireland. Um, in different contexts. And the same was true during the revolutionary period where, you know, de Valera, after all, spent most of the War of Independence uh, not in Ireland um, uh, directing operations, but rather in America trying to, to, to um, uh, reinforce American support, Irish-American support for Irish independence. So it's always the case of the Irish community here very actively pressing uh, Washington to do things, Washington being reluctant or pulled in different directions by its own, you know, global strategic uh, outlook. And then, and then, but importantly, the British government always being worried about the capacity for Ireland to 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 twist its its relationship with the United States out of out of uh, out of um, kilter. So, so actually, it is the it, I I believe firmly that Ireland would not have become independent uh, in the way it did in 1922, even with those limitations imposed on it, had it not been for the fact that the British government was was fearful of the capacity of Irish America to make serious trouble for them in the United States at a time when the United States had, had overtaken Britain and become the premier power in the world. And therefore its um, views had to be taken account of like never before. And I think that fear of what Irish America could do to Britain's reputation in America and could complicate, how it could complicate its relations with the United States was a factor during the revolutionary period and to some degree, it continues to be a factor, has been a factor in, in, in the recent uh, Brexit context, too. Yeah, if I could just um, uh, give a shout out to my old uh, alma mater, University of Notre Dame. Um, you know, a number of years ago, there was the Notre Dame produced documentary on the 1916 Rising that was all over you know, PBS in the, U in the United States and CBC here in Canada. And um, I'm sure many people have seen it, but you know, a, a big part of the thesis and the argument uh, and the contextualization of the 1916 Rising in that documentary is precisely the American diaspora's central role um, in, um, in that process. And it's also, uh, you could spend all afternoon trying to riddle off the names of prominent Irish Republicans, revolutionaries, and others who spent some part of that 10 year period or before in the United States. I mean, really incredible list of people who traveled there. It was very commonplace. And, and then, of course, all the so-called uh, Irish race conferences um, that uh, took place um, around with diaspora groups in, in, in elsewhere as well are a big part of that story, too. Yeah, Ma guys. Margaret Skinner was, uh, to be, return very briefly to the female perspective, yeah. Margaret Skinner, famously uh, a sniper in 1916, was in New York after the rising and joined the War of Independence with Republican women really whipping up this this support so absolutely as Gavin says so many of these figures you know cut their teeth over there politically as well as bringing in financial support and other other forms of support so um America played such such a hu huge role in that sense yeah and they usually and they usually came back and so as um the ambassador said of course you know De Valera spent much of the war of independence raising funds for uh the Irish Republic and trying to get congressional and presidential recognition and then he comes back and that that's a that's actually a significant, very significant change in the dynamics um, that I was kind of referencing in my paper. But the one that I always am fascinated by is the case of uh, Jim Larkin, uh, 
the great labor leader who left in 1913 uh, for the United States and didn't come back for 10 years. And when he returns, it's right at the end of the Irish Civil War. So he misses the entire rev revolution during which he, the entire time he insists he is the legitimate uh, secretary of his union, um, general secretary of the union. Um, and so uh, he spent a lot of the time in prisons and doing a lot of uh, interesting activities. But uh, for the most part, yes, there's a really strong um, kind of collaborative set of you know, energies between the United States and, um, and, uh, and, and Ireland throughout this period. Yeah. Thank you. And we're, we're rapidly running out of time, but maybe a, a few concluding remarks um, about um, the ethical aspects of the commemoration of the Irish Civil War um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of how uh, maybe you see that from the point of view of your own research. We have another question. We can't, of course, uh, with apologies to people who've asked questions, meet all of them, um, but brings up the, the, the question and the dynamic of Northern Ireland um, and, and whether, uh, you know, the, the commemorative aspect of the Irish Civil War has any uh, impact on what's happening and, and commemorative uh, um, uh, events taking place in Northern Ireland. So, um, Ambassador, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll start with you on that one. Well, I, I, I take the view that commemorations are a good thing, um, but it's not the same as history. Don't forget that. Uh, commemoration is, is rooted in the present and it serves the interests and the needs of, you know, today's um, um, people, the people who are around to commemorate, not the people who are being commemorated. They're, they're being commemorated. They're part of history. You know, the commemorators are all, are all in the here and now you know, and not historic. And, and, and therefore, therefore, there is a difference between commemoration and history. Um, and I think... Um, We've done a pretty good job over the last uh, ten years in in commemorating uh, in a way that um, I think cast light on the complexities of the past rather than trying to uh, stir them up uh, for any kind of uh, of um, ulterior motive. I, I think. I mean, at the time when I was in London in twenty fifteen, um, you know, there were people in the British system who were seriously worried that the 1916 commemoration might be um, an occasion for a kind of anti-British uh, sentiment to be unleashed in Ireland. And it couldn't have been anything further from that. In fact, uh, I remember being in Ivy House on um, Easter Monday, uh, 2016, uh, and there were talks, there were three or four talks that day in Ivy House, all very well attended by people and very different views of the rising were, were offered and they were all accepted with, you know, with, tolerance and uh, you know willingness to engage with different perceptions of, of the rising so i think i think the commemorative period has actually been a very productive one for ireland in terms of, of allowing people to to sift some of the issues of the past that might have been confusing for them and, and to come to terms with them in a more uh, a, a constructive and and considered way and i i i'm i'm hopeful that the same will happen uh, when it comes to the commemoration of next year's events and i've um uh, i i've suggested that maybe we should also uh, look a bit more um obviously there's going to be a celebration of the centenary of james joyce's ulysses which in some ways relates to the revolutionary period because it's a portrait of ireland before the revolution uh, changed it uh, forever uh, and then of course in 2023 you have the centenary of wb yates's nobel prize it's another centenary that one could rally round and, and build a consensus to regard it as a celebratory moment rather than a moment fraught with, you know, with tensions and contradictions drawn from our, uh, from our past. Thank you. And Gemma? Yes, another, another great question. And I think um, I, I like the ambassador's point about culture. I think culture can bring us together. And in terms of ethical remembering in, in, in my area, I think it is a case of sharing these more difficult stories and acknowledging people on all sides and by people i mean men and women and children who suffered um with in relation to the to the, the northern irish question i think it is quite tricky because the civil war affected northern ireland but partition had happened beforehand so it's almost that that issue has kind of been taken out of the debate slightly in that it's not something that dominated the concerns of the treaty debates it's not something that i've seen really shaped the violence at at a local level, of course, the, the the Northern Ireland almost has its own has its own timeline, if you like, and there's a 
a great BBC podcast at the moment called Year 21 that really goes through a lot of these issues. And there we have politics and civil war fusing with sectarianism and labour, which we don't quite have to the same degree in the South. So in the sense that there's these more difficult questions uh, to come. So as to how far that civil, you know, civil war remembrance might trigger further issues that's I mean hopefully not I think that as the ambassador says you know I'm uh, very sort of heartened especially when I working in a UK university where I have a lot of colleagues looking at British history British colonial pasts you know Ireland I feel has been a lot more upfront <laughs> and engaged with some very tricky topics more so than uh, the UK state I don't think that's too controversial to say um, so you know I think that there's always going to be these political triggers, whether it's Brexit, whether it's other issues going on in, in the in 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 the moment, and hopefully um, we can all weather these with with these kind of events, right? With culture, we're talking about we're talking about history. So I'll hopefully end on a I'll end on a hopeful note. Hope I think. Thank you, Gemma and Gavin. Yeah, I think that's a great a great question. I was you know thinking about how to answer it. It's very tricky. Um, and uh, both Gemma and the ambassador have kind of brought up a few points that I would have stressed. I mean, the ambassador's point is a, a very important one that all commemorationism is done for the present in, in many ways, right? And within uh, memory studies, which, you know, a lot of research about commemorations and how communities remember falls under the rubric of this kind of interdisciplinary area of studies called uh, memory studies, there's a, an acknowledgement that presentism, the, the influence of the present always happens. You know, history and time don't stop when you decide to commemorate something. You're doing them in a, in a given moment. So if you think for a moment, a big moment of um, commemorationism in, in modern Ireland, of course, was at the end of the 1990s when you had the bicentenary of uh, the 1798 rising. And that occurred right at the moment of the Good Friday Agreement in 1998 in the midst of this Celtic tiger. And so that those energies in, influenced and shaped a, a fairly optimistic, you know, reading of the 98 Rising and the uh, kind of enlightenment project associated with the United Irish Society. The end of the revolution now, which is happening in, you know, 2021 through 2023, is more complex. On the one hand, it's very auspicious that you have the first ever, you know, I, you mentioned it, I've mentioned it a couple of times, you know, uh, Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael with the Greens coalition. That technically speaking, represents the end of traditional civil war politics, right? So that's very auspicious in a sense for the for the two main sides of the treaty divide to be in a position, I think, to um, have a nonpartisan kind of ecumenical approach. But at the same time, of course, as the, the questioner mentions, this is occurring amidst Brexit. And indeed, I think another big part of this is obviously the COVID, the pandemic, and all the, the social fabric that's being rent and the political tensions around it. So that is going to shape um, I'm not sure what effect it will have. It will just, I think it will raise the issue, however, that when we often talk about the Irish Civil War, as Gemma said, we sometimes, you know, put partition aside because they're distinct conflicts. But, um, and then there's a big debate in Irish Civil War historiography about how significant partition was at the time. You know, there was a, an older work many years ago said, how, talked about how little partition was referenced during the treaty debates with the assumption being, therefore, it didn't matter much to the, uh, you know, those debating. Others have sort of challenged that and pointed all the complex ways that partition shaped the Civil War and vice versa. So, um, and that's still a growth area, I think, of research is kind of having to, um, you know, think beyond that, that, that physical line on, on you know, on, on the landscape and on maps, but that's also a psychological and mental line where we kind of, um, you know, periodize and, and uh, divide history along this line of partition. So it's hard, it's impossible to say what impact it will have, but there are still, of course, Republicans today, Republican parties and factions and commemorationists who see, uh, you know, partition as, as really one of the fundamental, um, you know, pieces of unresolved business of the Irish Revolution. So anytime you're commemorating, whether it's 1916 or the Civil War, anything happening in Northern Ireland, the status of partition, the whole question of reunification is still a live question 100 years later. Um, you know, so I'll leave it there. Excellent. Thank you very much, Gavin. With that, um, let me thank you all for your contributions. It's been a pleasure listening to you all and hand back over to Consul General Claire McCarthy and Director of Irish Studies, uh, Laurie Gallagher. Thank you so much, Jonathan, and on behalf of the, the Flint Centre for Irish Studies and ourselves at the Consulate, 
Um, sincere thanks to our esteemed panel, uh, Dr. Gemma Clark, Dr. Gavin Foster, and Ambassador Dan Mulhall. And special thanks to our moderator who did, I think, a really thoughtful and polished job. Thank you, um, on all of Professor uh, Jonathan O'Neill. Um, and special thanks, of course, to Jonathan and Laurie at the Flynn Centre for Art for Our Studies um, for everything that they do, but more particularly today for organising today's webinar. Uh, Laurie, you get the final word. Well, thank you, Ambassador. I think this has been a wonderful series that you've hosted on a farther shore. And particularly with the words today, uh, understanding the individual life stories about which Gemma and Gavin and even yourself have referenced, I think it, it helps achieve what I understood your intention to be, Ambassador, which was to help Americans understand the various aspects of the, this whole revolutionary time period and the Irish Civil War. And uh, you touched on a lot of that, uh, that rang true with members of my family not wanting uh, to talk about uh, this time period with my elder brother, who was a journalist. And so it, it is interesting how it, uh, I, you know, I think it really rang true. So I can't thank you enough, all of you, for being our guest today and Ambassador and Claire for you including us in this wonderful program. And I wish you all the best. Thanks everyone, have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.